Now, if I were to put a monster up here, everybody would look would say, wow, that's a good looking monster. And because we've never seen a monster before, so long as it's bright and shiny, it looks really upset, I think everybody would be rather satisfied by it. Well, this particular face uh, is uh, being rendered in real time, and it's not a photograph. Um, Lucas, let's, let's, uh, let's show them what, what Ari can do. Now, to, to um, <clears throat> let me explain some of the technology behind it. So first of all, in order to capture the human face, our skin is a living thing. Light penetrates through our outer layers, goes into the skin, bounces around inside, and then scatters, and then comes out, picking up some of the tone of the color of your blood. And as a result, when you look at it, um, it looks alive. Of course, there's a lot of pores. Um, your eyes are the windows to the soul. And so obviously, the eyes have to look alive. In this particular case, we use a technology called ray tracing to ray trace the eyes. That's why the eye crystal looks like it's, looks like it's alive. And of course, all of the shadows are being rendered so beautifully. You see no triangles, no faceting whatsoever. Triangles have disappeared. The lighting system is so sophisticated, we can pick up the little sheen of the oil of his face. Now let's change, uh, let's, I, I love the soft shadows underneath the lips. I mean, it's, it's so exquisitely rendered. Photorealistic. Okay, let's, let's, um, Lucas, walk us through some of this stuff. You, you, you do some talking here. Let me okay. spare a few seconds. Sure, so yeah, um, <laughs> this is Visual Ira, and uh, it's a data set from our friends at USC. And if you guys have been watching uh, previous time, we've actually seen that we've shown it on a GTX Titan, the same data set. So it's pretty cool this works on, on a K1. Uh, yeah, and as Jensen said, there's such sort of scattering um, in the, you know, the light going through the ears, also, you know, the light from uh, as if the shadow lands behind his nose. You can see if you turn it off, um, you can just see that like his, uh, his skin just kind of looks like plaster or something. It doesn't doesn't have the right effect, and so that's something that's you know it's quite computationally expensive and something that using Tegra K1 is possible on mobile finally. Now change the lighting environment. This isn't this isn't just lighting. This is image-based lighting. And look how the light is coming shining through his ears. You get some rim lighting off the edge of his head. And let's change the lighting yet again. That's just really stunning. If he was just more attractive. <laughs> I could sit here and look at him all night. Okay, so this, this, is a, this is a phase only a mother or a computer graphics company could love. Ira is actually his real name, he's a very good friend, and I apologize for that funny comment. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so, so but show, show us now what it's like if we didn't have all of the photoreal capabilities that our new, that Tegra offers, Tegra K1 offers. Sure. So this is, this, is what, this is what a face would look like using today's computer graphics. And notice, notice uh, it, it's a convincing head. I mean, when you look at it, you go, that's a head. Um, there's no question that's human. Um, but, but there's no question also, it's computer graphics. And this is basically OpenGL ES 3.0. Okay? All right, that's fantastic. Let's go to, let's show, let's show them something else. Let's show them something else. All right, so this is, um, we want to do something that, that is a big world. And this is something that Lucas did. Um, Lucas, why don't you talk us through it and I'll ask you some questions along the way. Sure. Um, so yeah, this is a, it's a, uh, Big superstructure actually, as opposed to just the head, um, and uh, has a lot of interesting features that are, that are cool. We have a we have um, pretty rich metallic materials. Um, we have HDR lighting and tone mapping, um, cinematic effects like um, with like uh, lens flare and bloom. Now show them what global illumination and HDR means. Sure. Can you do yeah. that. Yeah. It, 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 so do you guys know what HDR means? High dynamic range. Your eyes could see much, much larger dynamic range than a computer monitor 16 bits per pixel can render, okay? And so the, the, the way that we solve this problem, the way that we solve this problem, is we render to a much larger dynamic range inside the graphics processor, okay? Then we do essentially a tone map, a histogram of all of the tones in the scene. And we figure out where the tones are. 
and we remap that tone into a smaller color space. And as a result, we retain the, uh, the large distributions of the large contrasts. The deep darks and the bright whites are retained, but we lose, we change the, we retone, retone map, remap, if you will, um, the rest of the dynamic range to fit back into that of a computer monitor. And you can see that as you uh, as you go down, so like behind this building, as you uh, you see that it's pretty dark, right? But then as you zoom in and you cover up, you know, the sky, which is very bright, you start to see more detail that's in the previous dark area. Like in, when your eyes adapt, you know, to the brightness of the scene. But then as you as as you go up and you expose more of the sun, you'll see that it also you know it adjusts to allow you to see the sky, which you know relative to the back of the building is very bright. Yeah. Did you uh, show us what global, global illumination in HDR turned off would look like? Yeah, definitely. So um, sort of rendering this with, uh, with what it looks like using OpenGL ES3. Um, so this looks like a computer <laughs> graphics game today? Uh, yeah, I mean, right? Yeah. Not with this many geometry. I mean, this is still rich with, with polygons. But without global illumination, without high dynamic range, this is what your, what your games would look like. And let's turn it back on. It's almost a barrel of watch. Okay, so so that's uh, special effects, but but um, uh, the world the world is not always so peaceful, right? I mean, sometimes there's astronomic events. That's true. <laughs> I mean, you know what? S could happen, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So uh, we have a pretty cool bullet time back here, where you can sort of pan around and see all the volumetric. Um, uh, you know, explosions, particles, um, debris. Uh, we're using the uh, compute shaders to compute um, you know, the, the movement of things and the, the particle effects that happen. And so what's happening here is that Lucas is using the Tegra K1's 192 parallel cores to do physics processing. This is the same physics processing that supercomputers use, but fluid dynamics for nanomolecular dynamics particle simulations for astrophysics. It's exactly the same architecture, exactly the same type of program. Now it's running on 192 cores on the Tegra K1. Okay, you're, all right, you can play it by yourself on the side there. Let's, uh, let's keep moving. Okay, so that's, that's um, I, think, I think Lucas calls that demo the meteor. All right, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Global illumination, high dynamic range, incredible amounts of geometry, and now physics processing, all being done on the Tegra K1. Now, I want to show